Well, hello everybody and welcome. As a mark of respect to those who arrived on time, I'm nearly on time, we shall start already. Um, I hope that we'll be talking for no more than half an hour. I'll try to uh, be brief. Don't confuse you, could it be in brief? Um, and then we really welcome a rich discussion, I hope, about some of the points that we're raising. So I'm Rosie McGee. I work in the Power and Popular Politics cluster in IDS, and I'm the coordinator of the research, evidence, and learning component of Making All Voices Count. Uh, I'm Doug Edwards. I think I know all of you here. Um, and I'm um, in the digital development cluster here in IDS. And we're going to talk about opening governance or putting an open place on the status quo which is the title of the last issue of the IDS Bulletin, which, among other things, is the first IDS Bulletin of the new Open Access series of the IDS Bulletin. So um, do have a look at it if you haven't already. Um, <coughs> the way that we're doing the presentation is I'm going to speak first and present um, some key issues that we raise and discuss in the Bulletin, um, in particular, first of all, talking about our introductory article in which we kind of take stock of the field broadly speaking, with reference to the material that's in the, the article, in the, the issue. And then I'm going to hand over to Duncan to talk about some key specific messages um, that relate to particular articles in the bulletin. And we'll draw it to a close, as I say, hopefully within half an hour. So, <coughs> I think it's important to lay down a sort of historical marker in the sand for this. Making All Voices Count started in 2013. But it was on the back of several years of work in this field of what we were calling transparency and accountability, and now goes by a range of different names. And we'll be talking about that range of names and the sort of conceptual field a bit more broadly. Back in 2010, 2011, um, a piece of work was commissioned by an organisation called the Transparency Accountability Initiative, which is a donor collective uh, that brings together all of the major aid donors funding work in this field of transparency and accountability, which still exists today. And that includes public sector aid donors like the Department for International Development, but also philanthropic donors who fund heavily in this field. And they commissioned a piece of work, um, they commissioned IDS to lead it, and myself and John Gaventer led the work and several others from IDS contributed, notably Anu Joshi, who's here in the governance team, and Andres Mejia Acosta, who was here and has left. And the, the work was, we were asked to look at the impact and effectiveness of transparency and accountability initiatives to date. And it was quite a big piece of work looking at the use of these initiatives in lots of different sectors, which the donors prioritised. And it produced a synthesis report, which is available through the IBS website, but also on the website of the Transparency Accountability Initiative, as well as five separate sort of sector-focused reports. Um, Two key conclusions from it were that the evidence in the field was very patchy um, and uneven and not particularly substantial at that time compared to the amount of funding that was being poured into the field. And secondly, that one of the reasons why the evidence base was fairly weak was because a lot of the initiatives that you could have been looking for evidence from uh, about impact and effectiveness had very poor theories of change. They had very weakly designed theories of change, but they didn't even have explicit theories of change. They had implicit, quite confused, muddled theories of change. And without a clear theory of change, of course, it's difficult to know where you're trying to look for effectiveness or impact, what exactly you're trying to look for in the way of effectiveness or impact. Um, at the same time as we were doing that work, the same uh, organization, Transparency Accountability Initiative, funded a parallel piece of work that was on what was then being called new technologies in the transparency accountability field, similarly trying to map what was going on in the way of technologically based uh, solutions to transparency and accountability issues and problems. And it, in complete parallel to us, came to a very similar conclusion in terms of weak theories of change and a huge amount of money going in on the basis of optimistic assumptions about the field rather than on the basis of good evidence and careful plotting of theories of change. So in the intervening <coughs> five years since we published that, some really important developments have happened in the field. Um, the, the most major one, perhaps, is that what was then a little trickle of sort of new technologies has become a flood. And there's a great deal of work going on in the field, which is technologically enabled solutions to the problems of um, lack of accountability or responsiveness in governance. And this has really substantially reconfigured ways of working in the field, funding practices, implementation practices, and generally understandings of transparency and accountability work. 
A separate but related development has been that uh, TNA's younger relatives, we might call them, open data, open government, e-government, open government data, have burst onto the scene um, and kind of crowded out or, or, or made much fuzzier the boundaries of what we're talking about here. And these are all an offshoot of a broader movement, which is the kind of broader open development movement and just the, the broader movement towards kind of openness in management of knowledge and information. But there's been a lot of convergence and conflation and I would say sort of conceptual blurring in the boundaries of these different things, which is not necessarily a bad thing in itself, but we want to point out some issues about this conceptual fuzziness. Um, the third really, really important development in this five-year period has been that the Open Government Partnership was launched. And you might have heard that it was launched in October 2011 um, by eight founding governments, including the UK, uh, the UK Working Post Partnership with the US, and a couple of governments from the Global South. Um, and it's now expanded to include, at the last count, 69 member governments. Um, and its aim has been to provide an international platform for supporting the work of champions of open government, working to make their governments more accountable and responsiveness. And there have been some criticisms of it recently in terms of the, the rapid spread being at the cost of depth and quality in what it's doing, but it's certainly been a huge sort of development in this whole field in the last few years. So these three significant developments have gone on against a backdrop of on the one hand, growing critical debates about these initiatives and the whole sort of burgeoning of this field. And on the other hand, still rising levels of aid and philanthropic funding to the field. And associated with that, growing pressure to demonstrate impact, to demonstrate that this funding is, is worth it. One of the pots of funding that uh, we've benefited from here at IDS is uh, in the form of Making All Voices Count, which is a program funded by a consortium, Department for International Development, USAID, the Omidia Network, and Swedish SIDA. And the program is led by a consortium, uh, managed by, led by HIVOS, and comprising also a Shahidi, Kenyan tech platform, and IDS. And IDS's role in the program is to manage a significant research, evidence, and learning component. And the overall purpose of the program is to explore the role of technology in relation to citizen voice and securing government responsiveness. And it's been doing this largely through funding relatively small projects that are experimenting with tech-based approaches to these challenges. Our, our job as the research evidence and learning component is to help contribute to the building of a more systematic, more solid evidence base in the field. And it is an interesting challenge because it's not just about academic evidence, because so much of what we need to be building is about evidence from practice. So, five years on from when we did this review here and raised those issues about theories of change and conceptual weaknesses, we brought out this IDS bulletin, which pre presents eight contributions from researchers and practitioners in a total of 15 countries. Five of these are focusing specifically on research that we've funded with the research evidence and learning component of Making All Voices Count. And I think collectively, the bulletin really gives a sense of, on the one hand, what has changed, and on the other hand, what hasn't changed in these last five years. And it's really a call to all interested parties to take stock and reflect on uh, what's happened in the field in these five years. I think the content really does capture some key contributions to building the theory and evidence base, on the one hand, and to understanding how impact happens and doesn't happen. And on the other hand, it captures some disappointing uh, sort of outturns in the sense that there's been too much continuity around some of the weaknesses of the field. Um, to take a step back then to where we were starting from when we started the research evidence and learning component of making more voices count, some key contributions to the theory and evidence base that have happened over recent years. I've just put up here some sort of key phrases and terms and I'll leave it to you to look more closely at uh, the relevant literature. Um, this concept of open development, which was really framed as a paradigm challenge to aid as we know it, it wasn't about technological widgets to solve very specific short-termist problems, but a, a bit of a paradigm challenge to aid funded development back in 2008, uh, very closely associated with IDRC in Canada. Um, you and Robinson, American scholars, problematizing what they called the new ambiguity of open government and open data. And their work was very much against the policy context of the US in the early 2000s and leading up to the US's key role in launching the Open Government Partnership under the first Obama government. Um, they concluded that the vagueness of open government, the phrase, has undercut its power. 
the concept, open government, in US policy speak, which is the founding concept of the Open Government Partnership, conflates two very different things. On the one hand, adaptable data, and on the other hand, accountable governance. And they point out that neither of those two causes is actually helped by this conflation, and that the conflation is also meaning that governments are tending to substitute tech initiatives, quick fix type tech initiatives, for the hard political changes that they should be making in the name of accountable governance. A further important contribution has been Tom Carruthers and Breckenmacher in 2014, who wrote about what they called the new development consensus of transparency, accountability, participation and inclusion. And they're saying this bundle of concepts which tend to get treated together as a development consensus actually bridge some very, very different practitioner and scholar communities. And the bundling them together does not particularly help in terms of recognising the politics behind each of those notions and some of the kind of implicit norms that are driving work in some of those fields. In particular, they too point to the fact that public reform, public sector reform, mm -hmm. is being conflated with a lot of much more political and less technocratic kinds of objectives, and that this leads to what they call a field full of distortions, shallow practice, rhetorical adoption of terms without changing underlying principles, inconclusive debates about the place of each of these four principles, and generally tensions between quite instrumentalist approaches to them and much more transformative approaches to them. Jonathan Fox in 2014, who had already published as long ago as, 20, as 2007, a key piece of work in this field about the uncertain relationship between transparency and accountability, uh, then published in 2014 a really important piece of work rereading the evidence about what he calls social accountability practices and picking out the fact that there are essentially two sets of things going on there. One is what he calls tactical approaches, which tend to be bounded, localised, very much led by information, and by the notion that information is what's needed to make change happen. And what he calls more strategic approaches, which are about changing enabling environments, making more enabling environments for collective action, for scaling up citizen engagement from the local level to other scales, and to try to foster government capacity to actually make government responsiveness happen. And he points out that the initiatives that have questionable impact or weakish signs of impact tend to be the tactical approaches and that the strategic approaches show much more promising evidence of impact. Um, I think this raises the fact that information alone, which is what a lot of the tactical approaches are about, um, is insufficient to get collective action to happen, to empower the allies of, of accountable governance initiatives and to really attack vested interests, which is what real accountability politics um, needs to entail. So he's pointing out with this that lots of, lots of the uh, initiatives that we see around at the moment, which are billed as closing the feedback loop on uh, public service delivery, are tactical, and they miss out on that bigger, broader, more complex scenario, and as a result, they suffer from the weaknesses of tactical approaches that he identifies. So after this, he and a colleague called Thiago Peixoto, who some of us at IDS have worked with, particularly Evangelia in the Digital Development Cluster, um, did a rereading, of, did a, a fresh reading of the evidence of tech-based approaches to transparency and accountability. So the one I spoke about was non-tech approaches generally, and they took a sample of 23 ICT platforms that were aiming to promote citizen voice uh, in relation to improving service delivery. Um, and they look at the question of when does ICT-enabled citizen voice lead to government responsiveness. They pinpoint a series of factors that really determine the likelihood of getting government responsiveness. And there's two really important conclusions, I think, to this work. Firstly is that both the public disclosure of feedback from citizens and public collective action around the problem are crucial to holding relevant actors accountable. So civic engagement needs to drive what they call downwards accountability from state to society in order to be effective. And two ways in which that can best happen is that the public sees what the public says. So uh, information is posted on what, what citizens have fed back about quality of services or coverage of services. And the second point is that we then have to generate public collective action for those feedback, the bits of feedback to actually add up to closing a feedback loop and getting a proper response. And secondly, they point out that they conclude that service delivery user feedback is most effective when it increases the capacity of already willing policymakers to respond to the problem. So it cannot influence the willingness. Where the political will isn't there, uh, technological means for providing user feedback 
don't have any effect. Where the will is there, that, that feedback can in, uh, increase the capacity because it increases leverage and, and changes incentive systems for policymakers to respond. So I think those are two important, much more fine-grained, nuanced contributions to understanding what makes for an impact than we have had until now. To pull back a bit from these kind of details about particular bits of scholarship over the last few years, um, I think the, this problem about unclear theories of change, especially weak, untested assumptions, which was the major problem identified in this review back in 2010, 2011, um, is still around. So we're still seeing an awful lot of initiatives. In particular, that review by Peixoto and Fox pointed out that most of the initiatives in there suffer from the same problem. And they're initiatives which have been designed within these last five years. So we argue in the introductory article to the IDS policy in that this problem is still very much around. And that in addition, the field now suffers from this problem of conceptual ambiguity related to the concepts of open data, open government, open government data, e-government, and the sort of broad, broader, bigger, more political project of opening up governance systems and making them more accountable and responsive. So such a level of conceptual and consequently operational ambiguity is really less justifiable now than ever because there have been all those important pieces of work in the last five years that have been pointing to the ambiguities. Why does this matter? Well, I think there's some really important technical problems that come out of it as well as some really important <coughs> political problems. It's a technical problem because it, on the one hand, encourages tactical type, quick fix type solutions to long term, complex, deep seated political problems. Governance issues are long term problems to resolve, and these kind of widgety, tactical, quick fix type approaches just don't really have much hope of contributing to the kinds of governance transformations and shifts in power relations that would need to happen. But it's also a technical problem in the sense that it really hinders attempts to demonstrate impact. If you are unclear about where your conceptual boundaries are, if you're unclear about the theory of change, about first order objectives versus higher order objectives, it's very, very difficult to do that. And the field is under great pressure, even more pressure now than it was five years ago, to demonstrate impact. It is also a political problem because this conceptual fuzziness essentially clouds a lot of political and ideological differences between projects which are as different as opening up data and opening up governance processes so that marginalised citizens can engage in them. It generates a really false sense that everybody involved is all pulling together in one big common endeavour, which is not the case. And I think that with the persistence of these problems, we've got persistent, overblown expectations of what technologically-based approaches can contribute. And as a result, we've probably got a serious risk of a crash of legitimacy in the field because these are expectations which are very hard to, to deliver on or to answer to. So I'm going to hand over to Duncan to talk about some of the specific messages that are in some of the content articles of the bulletin and they relate to, to these issues. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, so as Rosie just highlighted, um, there's far more evidence um, existing now than ever before. Um, and that's the evidence that should be informing the design, um, the implementation of um, different kind of tech-based initiatives for citizen voice and democratic um, engagement. Um, the, the scholarly work that Rosie was talking about was from the period 2011 to 2016. And it could potentially go a long way to clear up a lot of that kind of conceptual uh, ambiguity um, and help in drawing out kind of more realistic and clear theories of change that should be informing initiatives and programming. Um, so are these recent contributions um, and the kind of emerging data that in, that's, uh, features in, in the bulletin actually getting through to informing um, practice. So I just wanted to turn to some of the articles in the bulletin to answer that question. Um, among the bulletin articles themselves, there's as well as several interesting informative kind of single cases, we have three survey articles which are reporting findings from three pieces of research that investigate a number of tech for TNA initiatives implemented over the past few years to explore their impact and effectiveness 
and what works and what doesn't. So uh, Rosie's uh, mentioned the Peshatu and Fox article, which examined 23 ICT platforms for citizen voice to improve public service delivery. Of these, the 12 which rest on an implicit market model, so individual demand for good quality services provided, provides its own supply, achieve very low government responsiveness. So very little impact. Um, those that achieve medium or high government responsiveness did so because they were pushing at open doors. The political will was already there. All service providers were already acknowledging their own accountability in the way initiatives were designed. Um, <coughs> the Well article in that well, or well, in, well um, studied eight rural uh, water sustainability ICT solutions. Um, they analysed them for focusing on three variables, successful ICT reporting, successful ICT report processing, and successful service improvements through water scheme repairs. Only three out of the eight were successful on all three counts. So counted as successful overall. They also found that crowdsourcing of information often doesn't work, that the crowd doesn't come forward. They also found that, um, that the crowdsourcing of information might be appropriate for information on functionality. You know, does it work? Yes or no. But that in itself, it has no relationship to transparency and accountability. Any transparency and accountability that does happen, happens by means that are different to crowdsourcing. Um, and then a third article, the Wilson and Lanarol um, article, which is exploring the effect effectiveness of tech tools used in transparency and accountability initiatives. <coughs> Um, they researched 39, 39 tech for transparency and accountability initiatives um, and they found that less than a quarter of those cons considered by their own evaluation that the tech tool that they'd chosen was a success and that the choices they were, they were making uh, weren't actually made on the basis of evidence. Either that's evidence from others' experience or the evidence from piloting and testing the tools themselves. Um, all three studies show that not many ICT platforms aiming to close feedback loops by channeling citizen voice for improved service delivery actually had the desired impact. Um, the problem is still too often treated as you know, a purely technical problem or an informational problem and that that's to the exclusion of the political, institutional or cultural aspects. But these issues the down to fatal flaws in the theory to change of many of these initiatives. Um, but that was pointed out in that 2011 review, um, which was you know, widely circulate, circulated, well read, um, particularly in research and practitioner circles. But we still see these, these flaws coming up. Um, so in the introduction, we argue that the copy growth of conceptual ambiguity associated with the recent developments Rosie mentioned earlier are connected to this, as is the strongly normative belief that ICTs and openness are a good thing, which leads to uncritical attitudes and behaviours. So efforts at conceptual clarification and uh, demythologizing <laughs> Um, <laughs> need to continue, but the message isn't getting across. Um, so it's partly about continuing to clear up the conceptual fuzziness and sweep away all those normative value laden buzzwords. Um, and it's about stopping all the tech hype. Um, so evidence itself needs to be more open. It needs to be accessible and usable by those who need to access it. It's partly about opening up evidence and proactively making evidence accessible to more potential users. And IDS has got a long history of doing that kind of work and being effective at research uptake. But the image out there in the world is very much that academic researchers don't produce anything written with non-academic audiences in mind. Some of this is about 
academics learning how better to foster learning more effectively amongst practitioners. You do learning as we've done in MABC, but um, that many don't learn from reading literature reviews or policy briefs or evidence summaries. And that actually mimicking the learning practices of those, so in the case of MABC, as a lot of tech practitioners are currently engaged with. So, you know, peer assists, mentoring, you know, kind of active, more active forms of engagement. Um, but still, there is more evidence than ever before. And it's not getting used where it should be, even when it is in the public domain and when it is packaged specifically for those kind of audiences. So there are systemic biases in who will hear it, which you need to, to, to systematically work against in order to get those who get to those who could use it. So by simply opening up evidence, you don't get listened to by those who don't want to hear it. Um, you might enhance the capacity of willing listeners to hear it, but you don't increase the will of unwilling listeners to hear it. That makes sense. Um, there are clearly factors that discourage people from using evidence. Um, we need to look at incentives. What incentives are lacking? Um, framing innovation as always being about the brand new, and then framing programs as innovation and or designing them in kind of as innovation competitions or awards, promises that it will reward the brand new rather than carefully considered use of the existing or old. Um, those crowding into the sector of, of, of you know, tech for TNA, tech for governance, civic tech are not primarily researchers, but many are entrepreneurs or self styled innovators. We might expect them to see value of good, careful market research and market testing if they were using their own money as venture capital. But why would they do that when there is free money available to fail? Okay, to the next slide. Um, so technology is not is not introduced into a vacuum. Some are better placed to take advantage than others. Technology can offer some quite powerful opportunities in making budgeting and accounting, um, accounting procurement data more widely and efficiently available, to link different data sets, to trace financial flows, to allow individuals to rapidly connect and organize with others, but it's not entering an even playing field. And looking at the article from Emiliano Trere, who's looking at the use of technology by the Mexican government to manufacture consent in online disciplines. He examines how, attempt, how attempts by the, uh, blah, blah, blah. Sorry. So he, he's, he's looking at um, attempts by a new social movement, the Yo Soy 122 movement in Mexico, use social media and tech platforms to communicate, to mobilize, and develop their identity to challenge the president um, and his role in a violent repression of protest when he was governor of the state of Mexico. He highlights the Mexican government's actions in sophisticated tech-enabled infiltration, surveillance, and disruption of citizens' attempts to mobilize to gain accountability around this movement and in situations such as the disappearance of 43 student protesters in September 2014. Um, and then, then if you look at the Laura Newman article, she's looking at differentiated uh, realization of rights to information. So if we frame legislation as a technology of governance, then Newman illustrates that although men and women are legally have the right to information, women are significantly disadvantaged in their scope for realizing this right, and therefore have less poss possibility to the benefits that this right might lead to. We need to remember that the process of gaining accountability is a process of challenging power. And it's often the powerful who have the most resources and capacity to make use of technology to resist those that are challenging them. Um, we recognize the importance of collective, collective action, particularly for those who are most marginalized in aggregating the power that they have as individuals and in providing a degree of anonymity in keeping them safe. 
use of technology can distract from collective possibilities and it can also make the individuals visible. And we need to question whether this reduces the power of collective action. Um, then innovation. Innovation, use of technology within social processes. That's a long-term socio-technical process. For example, back in the year 2000, it's the height of the dot-com bubble, I was working for an online retailer. And like many others who were engaged in online retailing at that point, we were all operating at a loss. And we were only able to survive and innovate because investors were willing to play long, the long game and lose money on the promise of future returns. It's taken many years of innovation in technology, in financial systems, in logistics, and customer behavior to enable, enable online retailing to become a viable and mainstream operation. We also need to recognize that a shift towards more, more accountable governance is a long-term political process. And this fact is borne out clearly in the IDS bulletin articles by Guerrero, um, Mills, and Ateneo. Um, so I just wanted to talk very briefly about each one of those. Um, so Miguel's article, um, it explores what it takes to make the state actually listen to people. It covers four case studies of historical policies in Ghana, Kenya, South Africa, and Tanzania to exa examine how states engage with citizen voices. The policies all took, the pl took place in the context of political change and major junctures of democratization. Change towards more accountable governance happened when there was a shared sense of urgency and a common goal across state and non-state actors. And despite different understandings of accountable governance. <coughs> um, but these changes are laborious and are temporary and part of a larger ever-changing policy process. And often the states quickly revert to shallower forms of engagement with people. Um, the change struggles described do not rest on technology. They're complex. They're long-term governance change struggles. Um, the Mills article. Uh, so South Africa joined the Open Government Partnership in 2011. Most of what it committed itself to as an ODP member is about improving public services creating safer communities, and increasing accountability. This article contrasts these international commitments to open governance with ethnographic research, accounts of citizens' everyday engagement with the state at a micro level. It highlights the value of people, in this case, HIV positive citizens living in Cape Town, sharing their real life experiences of public service provision and engagement with the state. The article reflects first on how citizens see the state in relation to service delivery, and second on how they speak to the state as members of civil society. It offers an understanding of how citizens themselves perceive open governance in their everyday, everyday lives. There is no short-term tech fix to the deficits and faults in governance as experienced by these people. The Ottenea article explores how a movement for social justice <coughs> whose main members are mainly drawn from the lower economic strata of society, build and sustain its power in the face of corruption uh, and social and geographic divisions. The Bunge Lumawananchi movement in Kenya casts spaces for debate, activism in the urban public sphere accessible to the unrepresented masses. Um, the authority to leave these spaces largely unmolested in part because the corruption of politicians and civil society organisations is as effective at wrong-footing the movement as mass arrests and riot police would be. The research reminded the members of that movement's power has always laid in its efforts to reach across internal divisions of ethnicity, gender, class and geography. These char characteristics of innovation and transformative governance work seem at odds with many aid funding practices. <coughs> Um, yeah, it's unrealistic to expect quick wins and governance outcomes from short-term tech projects. More realis realistic 
would be to look for knowledge outcomes that contribute to future learning and innovation. That requires encouraging practitioners and technologists to be more humble and articulate what they don't know. MABC has essentially been funding experiments. I am trying to explore whether using mo mobile technology and this mapping platform can help inform and stimulate co collective action, you know, things like that. Um, but it's been a very hard to cultivate the sort of self-critical reflective capacity among uh, the grantees that the program is supporting. So if donors are going to support and fund technological innovation governance, they need to attach meaning to the concept of innovation. Innovation could be usefully, usefully framed as a learning and knowledge endeavor. Whilst the goal is accountable governance, valuing knowledge outcomes as highly as governance outcomes could be a useful way to frame them. If we're serious about making a contribution to the use of technology for governance, we need to actually value knowledge generation and learning as a process. So, technology. Oh, oh no. Sorry. no, that is the right Don't slide. I've got the wrong note. Right. Um, so, Jonathan Fox uh, argues that strategic approaches to social accountability tend to have more impact than tactical approaches. Um, Rosie mentioned the distinction that Fox made um, between strategic approaches and tactical approaches. So to remind you, tactical approaches are bounded interventions, li limited to society-sized uh, efforts. And many assume that information provision alone will inspire collective action with sufficient power to influence public sector performance. Uh, strategic approaches, in contrast, deploy multiple tactics and they encourage enabling environments for collective action and they coordinate citizen voice initiatives with governmental reforms that bolster institutional responsiveness. So overly focusing on, on the technology can very easily lead to dominance of ta tactical approaches rather than seeing technology as an enabler of particular parts of a much wider accountability process. Um, go to the next slide. So, as a parting thought, and it's rare that I get the last word um, in our team, um, <laughs> technology can be seductive. It promises so much. It promises change at, at large scales. There's a seductive narrative about the disruptive power of technology, that power can disrupt and positively transform the rules of the game. This narrative has got uncritically read across the field of government and accountability, as tech-enabled experiments have flooded the field. But in some ways, tech can be a distraction. That, quoting Bruce Lee, it's like a finger pointing away to the moon. Don't concentrate on the finger, or you will miss all that heavenly glory. Thank you. <laughs> so leaving that in the hands of the renowned scholar Bruce Lee. <laughs> um, sorry to be taken a little bit long in half an hour, but we would really welcome questions, comments, responses to the provocations, endorsement of the provocations, thoughts about where IDS is in all this. It's great that we've got lots of members of the Digital Development Cluster here, which is our newest innovation in ideas and the way of responding to all of these challenges. So we're chairing ourselves, so perhaps we could just take a few comments at a time and come back. Uh, I've got one, having been at the kind of front end of uh, working in technology of human rights and accountability for quite a long time, and working on um, looking at donor priorities. And I know I worked on a big report for the Transparency and Accountability Initiative about mentoring and how successful mentoring was mm -hmm. as an approach um, in this field. Because you, it doesn't have to be north to south, it can be in some cases these were south to south collaborations, individual mentoring. And there's a thing about funder priorities that it's just not very sexy. It just it hasn't got a big competition attached to it, it hasn't got a it's not mobile enabled, and actually in some cases in this project the mentors were going in and saying use less tech. Uh, stop doing that, stop hiring this self-proclaimed local expert to do this because it's just 
and there's something about like how can what's our role in educating because there, there is a kind of argument that when MAVC came along with their kind of shiny competitions it really distorted the sector and I was out I was kind of in the sector at the time and you could see it's like oh flooding to water and you don't just see it with MAVC you've seen it in the kind of tech for refugee space which I've done some work on as well mm -hmm. There is an argument about actually the stuff that often works is the kind of unsexy capacity building and things like mentoring, which do did really, really work, but people just weren't going to fund it because it hasn't got a big kind of shiny finish mm -hmm. or like shiny product at the end. So I think what's the, what can I can be done? This is, this is part of what we can do, but how can we educate donors to, to fund more intelligently in this field? Um, yeah, thank you. A really great presentation. And, and also the bulletin as well, which has been widely read and widely tweeted, and lots of people that I have been meeting has been kind of coming back to me and telling me how good it is um, around donor organisations and others. I guess I've got um, three, three points really, um, or questions or reflections. One's about the evidence. One's about the, the state of this, this space, and one, one's about the future of this space. So around the evidence, Duncan, you, you kind of, both of you were talking about that, there is more evidence that's out there, and you, you reflected on what the, ins, uh, the fact that there are incentives and so on. But uh, do you think it's fair to say that a lot of the evidence that's out there is evidence of what not to do, rather than evidence of what to do? So don't build new technology products without paying attention to context. Do, um, don't go in alone. Um, don't um, aim for short-term gains when you know. Uh, <coughs> you know. Don't aim for superficial approaches. And there's actually much less evidence on what works effectively. Um, I'm, ju I'm just putting that to you. And I, and I wonder if that part of the part of what we know about um, evidence-based policy is there's always going to be, regardless of the sector, there's always going to be disincentives as well as incentives. And I think some of the disincentives in this sector around the speed at which these things are supposed to come up, the, the, the spin around it, the kind of technology spin, there's, 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 there's a degree of kind of built-in secrecy that people have which are based on having their own particular projects and that they support. There's, there's actually some inbuilt superficiality that's incentivized amongst te technology companies who are doing this stuff. And, and there's a degree of, um, scientific ignorance, I guess, They're both social scientific and so So if you take all of those disincentives, um, is the way that we're packaging and providing that evidence actually sufficiently um, constructed to actually deal with this? And I'd probably say uh, you've got, on the one side, did these disincentives, on the other side, um, lots of evidence of what not to do, and I don't see the two come together very well. So, so that's one reflection on the evidence. The second point is actually in relation to that, that in any field of evidence, any field, whether it's the governance or whatever, it's windows of opportunity that actually enable this. It's not like there's a policy set of policy makers out there that are ready and waiting for the evidence once it's in the right form. There are windows of opportunity, and they come through the interaction of institutions, of, of ideologies, of interests, um, and, and, and information. And I think, what do you think the windows of opportunity are for something like, let's say, your own bulletin to actually have an influence on. Are we thinking enough about those windows of opportunity? Mm. And I guess the, the very final point is just, if we're looking at the future, and that, as this is a, a trope, I think we can see this, this stuff either becoming a short-lived fad, we can see it turning into a kind of institutionalized silo where, a uh, short-lived fad where people basically you know, don't interest and move on, people stop funding this kind of stuff, and they move on to tech for something else and something else for governance and the whole thing's kind of forgotten. Um, an institutionalized silo where, where it actually becomes supported but it's not actually threatening to anyone, it's just another piece of the, the aid land apparatus, where it actually becomes a sustained catalyst for change. And on the basis of what you're saying, I think it's probably somewhere between short-lived fad and an institutionalized silo at the moment. And, all the, and I guess going back to that window opportunity, what can we do to, if there is potential, do you think there's potential for it to be a catalyst and what can we do in the evidence space to, turn, to achieve that? Um, try and answer that. Have we got any more to take with that? Okay. 
Uh, yeah, I've got three questions, two of which are linked. One of them is around, um, you sort of talked about kind of a positivist attitude towards tech hype. I just kind of wonder where that comes from. You know, who's driving that? Is that driven, you know, given that the world's largest companies are tech companies, is there a kind of an underlying uh, sort of private sector push, as it were, that is slightly invisible, that we kind of don't really know about, or that we're kind of being influenced by now knowing it. Um, so, and, you know, I was, I was struck by the whole sort of Facebook fiasco in India, where they tried to provide free internet access to, you know, rural farmers, and it all kind of ended up with egg on their face, because no one wanted free internet access, that wasn't really internet access. Um, and I guess linked to that, who's kind of building the technology? I mean, are we talking about kind of off-the-shelf Type products that were, you know, manufactured back in the states, type thing, or is there? Have you come across examples of um, picking up? I'm um, sorry, I don't know your name, but the comment, the, the comment you made about sort of low tech. I mean, you know, ICTs, information and communication technologies, we're, we're instantly assuming digital, but obviously communication doesn't have to be digital. So I just wondered whether there were examples that have come up in an ABC work of non-digital or low tech. Uh, indigenous technologies uh, that we may have overlooked because they're, they're harder to identify and measure. So that's kind of linked out. And the third question is, have you come across any examples as a kind of an underlying assumption that, you know, here's the technology, um, and then if, if only everyone used it properly, then, you know, accountability would happen. And I know that the research is questioning that, but has, is there the opposite effect? So we talk about collectivism here, where actually there's a kind of a passive, there's a kind of, I think I've done something to make people accountable because I've liked this Facebook page. And then I've then kind of renounced all sort of ownership of the problem because, you know, um, I've signed that e-petition or whatever it is, therefore it's gone, off, gone away from me. So I wondered if, if that kind of um, had come up in, in either the MABC work or, or some of the articles you talked about. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, what can RDS do to educate donors in this field? Um, yeah, I think I think there's there's an information there's a danger that you fall into an information gap um, way of framing that. It's not as if a lot of donors don't know that there's problems with the way that they're funding. Um, you, know, you talk to a lot of people that differ and they recognise that um, you know, they should be looking for short tech fixes, but then they still keep calling for these things. Um, I mean, we've um, recently, uh, we were recently um, doing a seminar at the theatre and to engage them with the findings of this. Um, but within the MABC program, you know, we've got a stream of work over the next year, 18 months, which is going to try and engage donors more substantially in the early agenda around some of these issues. Although we find that quite daunting, because I think so many approaches have been tried and the information gap is not where the problem lies. And uh, um, on one or well, several of the pen's points. Um, <coughs> I think a lot of it comes down to kind of roles, responsibilities and expectations of evidence and evidence building um, in this field. That actually, do we need to, as researchers, need to be looking at how we do research? You know, more engaged ways of doing research that are more about the kind of process rather than Um, I was at a Tic Tech con conference last week, which is a conference bringing together um, researchers and practitioners looking at um, civic technology. One of the things I was talking about there was the some of the expectations that, that practitioners have around evidence. You can't, you can't get in. I'll hold you accountable. <laughs> 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 that in many cases, because what an innovator, 
in, 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 in the very innovator is doing is new in a new context. You won't have ready made evidence that will tell you what to do. But a lot of practitioners are expecting that. They're saying, why haven't you got a case study that tells me what to do in this situation? You know, and part of that is not recognizing the complexity of the problems that we're looking to address. So <coughs> that kind of issue. Um, <coughs> sorry. sorry to arrive late, but... Um, Pardon, my glowing answers to a question after you've left, then. <laughs> <laughs> are you, you, you asked later? Uh, not much. Okay. Apologies. Um. Also, anybody who needs to leave now, please feel free. We'll, we will carry on, but we recognise some people need to go. Um, so, just to come back with a few points, they were both, they were all three of some really interesting, thought-provoking questions and comments. So, um, I think on Ben's point in his absence, I would say um, you know, he was suggesting that there's more evidence out there on what not to do than there is on what to do. I think I would contest that slightly. You know, there's not there's not a totally amazing, brilliant quantity of evidence still anyway. There's just more than there was five years ago. Um, I would contest his point slightly because I think most of the energy, the evidence out there about what not to do isn't really worthy of the name evidence yet because it's basically bad practice that hasn't been passed through a carefully processed, critically processed um, analysis to turn it into useful evidence. Is bad practice, and yes, people can learn from experience, and we would hope that more people would learn from experience than I'm learning from experience. But I think that there's uh, a lot that still needs to be taken up and turned into evidence. And I found it really surprising at that Tic Tech conference last week when I used I was using the word evidence, and somebody among the, the participants said, "Yeah, but where practitioners go to find out what works, they don't go to the evidence. They go." To, and I said, well, "What do you mean by evidence?" And they said, "Well." published research. And I said, oh, my definition of this is much, much broader than that. I consider practice and experience, processed experience, critically processed experience, as a really important source of evidence. So I think some of these even quite semantic issues are quite significant here. Um, but I think on Ben's point as well about the fact that there are not enough what to do messages, there are a lot of what not to do messages. And um, I think a lot of it is, that, is things that people don't want to hear. Yeah. I mean, the so message about yeah. context matters. Yeah. How many times has that been said? How many of us in the room would dare to say that we'd never heard that one or that we didn't realize that one? We all know it. Yeah. But the point is, ignoring context enables you to do transference and scaling up and scaling out. And it, it goes in direct tension with some of the ways in which donor modalities tend to operate. So I think that the problem isn't that there aren't lessons out there about what to do. It's that a lot of those messages are uncomfortable and inconvenient for some of the key actors who are pulling the strings in this field. And a lot of the strings are about funding, and some of the strings, as Emily was getting at, I think are about sort of normative, ideological projects of a much bigger nature, a much more kind of, uh, you know, you could get into kind of Chomsky and Gramsci here, but I think uh, ideological projects that have, which connect openness um, in a range of different sort of understandings or fields. I was at the first Open Government Partnership uh, Summit in London in 2013, um, which was only, had only been running for two years. David Cameron gave the keynote address because he was hosting the conference. That's you know, one of the founder governments of it. And I nearly left the conference because I just thought this is not anything to do with what I signed up to. I was signing up to Open Government as an idea that's about transparency and accountability and fairness of the system to the poorer, more marginalized actors in the system. That was all about free trade, basically. So I think one of the really big problems is that, and it's that this is why I see this conceptual ambiguity issue as being a serious problem, because everything masquerades as one big happy family all in it together and all pursuing the same objective. And actually, there are ideological poles apart in some of the things which go under that broader umbrella. Um, I wanted to come back as well on the, your question of who's building the tech. Brilliant question. My disappointment in making a voices count has been that some of the actors who you would think would be best positioned mm -hmm. to recognize the need for the low tech and to develop the low tech are the ones who are blindest to some of these issues about tech hype. And I'm afraid I think that is to do with, you know, again, we're going into kind of cultural studies and imaginaries of modernity and things. But I think there, there's a lot that has to do with this kind of, you know, bigger global hegemony thing about what people see as modern and progressive and what people see as development, and um, the fact that you know, we, in one of the learning events that we organized within Making a Voices Count in 2014, we held it in Tanzania, and we had a site visit on the middle day of this week-long workshop. 
where we took people out to urban and rural sites in and around Dar es Salaam just to hang out, just to look, just to listen, and to get a feel for where they were and to talk to who they could talk to and to come back and reflect on the experience. Well, first of all, people were just really non plus like, what were we meant to be doing? What information were we meant to be gathering? What were we supposed to be counting? We're saying, let's just be counting anything. These are the kinds of places where the kinds of tech innovations that Making Your Voices Count could be funding should be benefiting people. What did you see? Had you ever been somewhere like that before? Had you noticed there was no logistic connection? And some of these things, you know, people from the African continent who were reflecting on these things for the first time, maybe? So I think that this is one of the really good points. And it's not, you know, this is no criticism of all of the tech developers in the African continent. It's about the way that this has all been framed as the new and the modern and the projects coming from this global north, which is the center of everybody's aspirations. So it's a very disappointing one that you don't get more. There are some brilliant counterexamples. I know that Ben has come across some brilliant counterexamples in the work that he was doing with the humanitarian in the humanitarian sector before of fantastic adaptations of low technology to really, really good effects. But I'm afraid that the general trend is not that at all. I think we can probably <coughs> take another round of questions, <laughs> comments, yeah. Um, can you just maybe elaborate a little bit more on the tensions between the different um, communities that you mentioned around those working on transparency or accountability or open data and open governance and, and where, yeah, where those tensions might be? And um, my other question is around um, kind of the, the sociology of this, um, this issue. Like, is it a problem of getting social scientists to talk to tech geeks? Is that, is it, is it? That's <laughs> 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 and, and, and how, how might that, I don't know, be overcome? Um, I was, was going to ask um, as well, um, have you got this, you've just delivered package somehow that we could, and are we allowed to share it elsewhere already? I mean, I've read the bulletin and it's excellent, but is what you've delivered shareable? Um, only because whilst we're talking about it in a development context, mm. it's very applicable right now to the UK. Yeah. Um, and I've been part of the open government process around data sharing um, because there's uh, current legislation coming to uh, public administrative data and that will affect governance and it is a massive change program. Um, so I'd love to be able to pass that on um, and actually share that elsewhere if, we're, if, you, if you'd be allowed, if you'd be happy to. Um, but I wonder if how we can address somehow the the speed of technology and the application of evidence, um, because we seem to be moving with the support of the Pearsons and others, the players in the world, at a rapid implementation of tech based on nothing, <laughs> on this will be a solution, and the, the, the policy makers who have the funding are working to a five-term political frame. Mm -hmm. and don't have any vision of what could be possible over the longer term. Mm -hmm. So I would love to see people in academia be bold about projecting vision and suggesting visions of longer term achievement and not focusing only on evidence of what has happened in the past. Mm -hmm. Because in fact, I think we, we, we do ourselves a disservice of there is a gap of needing a vision but the people who have the knowledge don't provide it because the academia doesn't see it as their role. Mm -hmm. and that is one of the things we <laughs> want to do actually in the, yeah. in the cluster. Is some kind of for, we're, do, we're doing some foresight work actually. Yeah. That's one of the things we're planning at the moment. We're just in a meeting with the Web Foundation to talk about it. Yeah. So it's actually, yeah, that is something we are. Yeah. So it's desperately we're looking, we're desperate, we're looking for <laughs> input as well. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. in evidence, you know, we've got India putting out biometrics into the field yeah. when nothing works and mm -hmm. the people can't eat because they can't access their free programs. I mean, <laughs> it was desperate. <laughs> yeah. And yet, that yes, would have been, so. if you had asked mm. people who had been there, mm. you'd say that is completely impractical. <laughs> <laughs> will not work. Yeah. I think that touches on the, the response against them yeah. actually looking at the role of researchers within some of these purposes. Mm. That, you know, the, I think in, in one way it's, it, it's less about producing the evidence and asking the right questions at the right time. Mm -hmm. That 
questioning what's going on and uh, getting people to think that you know if the evidence doesn't exist, you've got a problem there. But actually asking the right questions is, is as important. As well. um, and yeah, you know, the, the the historical context bit and the you know the changing regimes things I think is really interesting. And uh, we were in the Philippines in February and went to a place called Naga City, which has had a very consistent administration for the last twenty years. And it was an administration with a very clear vision of what it wanted to do in terms of participatory governance. And it's, it's provided the consistency over that time mm -hmm. by which the kind of technology options that they're using are being very much embedded in visions and participatory governance. So, I mean, that could be an area mm -hmm. to look at. Yeah. I want to come back on the sociological one. <laughs> um, is it a problem for guessing social scientists to talk to tech geeks? Yes, in a really big measure, yes. And um, I mean, we've had a lot of starting from tech geeks and social scientists. We've had quite a lot of interesting conversations about this. Um, I think it's a really big part of the problem. They don't just come from different disciplines. They don't just use different jargons and languages according to their different disciplines. They come from fundamentally different worldviews in many cases. So you know, me talking as a social constructivist can be talking at totally cross purposes with a tech innovative person or a, a program software writer who comes from a totally positivist paradigm and has never seen that there are other ones, mm -hmm. um, has never asked themselves a question about it because that's not what software developers tend to do all day. Um, that's a really big part of it. Another thing which we found has been a massive sort of culture clash problem is um, coming from the, the fact that these groups of actors come from totally different organisational cultures, right down to cultures of kind of accountability. And now I'm using kind of accountability with a small a about what is our accountability to the sector? What's our accountability in terms of quality and ethics? Um, and here, just to give an example, I think in the way that making your voices count works, we've got this research evidence and learning component, which is essentially needing to give research grants, spend research money well among a field of social scientists and committed um, applied researchers and practitioners with a research bent. And on the other hand, we've got the geeks. Some are very nice. Um, so we have, we have this kind of, we have it represented within all of the projects that we work with. And we also have it represented in microcosm in the fund management consortium. And I think that's why we won the bid. So we've got HEVOS, which is an international NGO that essentially you know, positioned itself there because it's into, it's, it can manage regrant in, in a big way because it's an INGO with you know, operations for regranting partners all around the world. We've got the Shahidi, which is a Kenyan tech platform that had never had anything to do with the aid and granting culture before, but it's, they're the techies, they're the ones who are the geeks and talk to the geeks. And then there's IDS, which is what it is, that I would aim to describe it. Um, so we've got it in microcosm among ourselves. And within the course of the program, you know, if we'd had a, a good long inception period for the program, we could have done that really good practice about working in intercultural groups and surfaced the differences and thought about what everybody brought to the table and how to turn that into a positive virtue and a value adder for the program. Yeah. We didn't have that, we had to start dispersing immediately. Yeah. And so then you have to deal with these things as and when they come up. And they come up through a great deal of tension and confusion and contestation among yourself as a consortium and all of the different publics that the consortium is relating to. So for me, one of the really big lessons for donors is about that. If you want to have consortiums made of the unusual suspects for achieving unusual things, you need to allow an unusual length of, of time, length of time yeah. and liberty for those things to happen, and you need to facilitate them really well, or get people in to facilitate them really well. So for me, that's, that's been a massive, I mean, it's not something that I was surprised to find, but to me, that's one of the really big points of our learning for donors. I think one of your other question about, um, the tensions between the sort of open data type community and the transparency and accountability <coughs> community. I would say the simplest difference is that the open data community tends to see the problem as technical. In fact, they don't <coughs> see the problem. They come up with a solution as technical, and then they go looking for the problem. And on the transparency and accountability side, there's a much more political understanding of what the problem is, which by implication, I mean uh, a much longer term, deeper, more intractable set of issues that you're trying to address that, that are not amenable to any solution, that it isn't a solution like that. Governance is a field of conversation, it's a field of conflicting interests. There is no solution. There's a 
uh, an ongoing set of contestations that will always be played out, and you can tilt the balance one way or another to favour one side or the other in that over time. Um, and then I think one of the other really big tensions, as I see it, is um, about this relationship between transparency or openness and the outcomes in terms of more accountable governance and development outcomes for people. So the TNA activists, I would say, since that article of Jonathan Fox's back in 2007, uh, have been aware that you shouldn't assume an automatic relationship between transparency and accountability and good things for poorer people. Um, I think that open data, you know, people who were promoting, who have been promoting that over the last 10 years, weren't coming at it from that direction, and therefore have got a much more kind of optimistic set of assumptions around what openness can achieve. Um, and then I think there are all sorts of drivers that are feeding that much more optimistic vision, which are some of the things that we've mentioned. Um, and so that's not enabling people to stop and stand back. You know, even if some of the open data people wrote about the dangers of of open data empowering the empowered mm -hmm. and you know feeding into an unlevel playing field so some of their own have been talking about it but i think there are a lot of disincentives to stop and listen to that and that's partly to do with these very different sort of cultural contexts in which both both lots are working um, on the uk issues i really agree one of the interesting bits of the um tic tech conference last week was a presentation from the ceo of the tinder foundation mm -hmm. talking about her role in on the UK end, and it's, you know, on, on the one hand sort of shocking and disappointing that in the UK all the same things are going wrong, and on the other hand completely unsurprising because it's all part of the same, the same world, I think, the same, you know, tech hype knows no, knows no national borders, it seems. Um, so it's really interesting for me because I don't tend to kind of, you know, find out things about that in my own country. But I think um, on the thing about um, how to share things, yeah, I mean, it made me reflect that, um, we should maybe be trying towards the end of this program to be talking not just to our government people as in DFID, but to be talking slightly wider across Whitehall. And likewise, in the six priority countries of making all voices count, we should be talking to those who set technology policy, not just to those who set development policy or influence governance levers of change. How to do that is a different matter. Um, and as Duncan said, when we were at DFID recently for this seminar, um, one, of the, one of the really interesting observations, ethnographic observations that I made in that seminar, was that they got a total divide there between the techies, the data people in Dickett, and the governance people, talking completely different languages. And you know, in that, they're several years behind us, because we can now have a conversation. <laughs> 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 they're several years behind us, and it's not been surfaced. And they all said to us afterwards, oh, um, that was really interesting, because we're just about to start working on the new Dickett transparency strategy in which both lots are going to be engaged. So I was thinking, wow, that's going to be a very interesting experience. And there's just there's so much out of the experience of making all voices count that they should be building into that. And I expect there'll be a real limit to how much they can build into it because of the institutional constraints that shape how a strategy writing process in a, in a public sector institution goes. But in terms of substance that could be useful in it, there's a massive amount. Yeah. Just thinking, in terms of access, the way in might be open in that, as you said, it is the key word in everything right now. If you say open, you know, they're interested. And uh, I would say if you were able to get into open access debates, discussions, conferences, mm. I mean, Madrid in October is probably too late to put a mm. speech in. But, um, mm. you know, it's... You're, listen. you're in that quite a lot from before, didn't you? <laughs> but I think, I mean, also all of the stuff, we've been trying really hard with making all voices count to do our research in the open and to put our research in the open. So everything that we produce is fully accessible. Um, this seminar is being recorded and we can probably, it's being recorded for two specific yeah, purposes, but we can, probably, um, <laughs> we can probably provide you with access to it if you want it. Likewise, something else that might be of interest is we're just about to produce a learning report um, out of the, this year's annual learning event that happened in Manila in February where we address a lot of these issues. And you know, we're really trying, in a way, in these annual learning events that we hold, to directly address, to problematize and address that problem of different cultures. Because we have in the room our research grantees, who are the social scientists coming from university departments or research think tanks or whatever. And on the other hand, people who are tech developers and might never have shared space with people like that. So the learning event, was, and it's not a typical event report, it's designed as a resource for people who really want to kind of engage with these issues and try to stimulate more thoughtful, critical practice in this area. Here we go. I've just got a puzzle here. That you're saying one of the key issues here, one of the problems, is that there a lot of these projects have flawed theories of change. But one thing that I was curious about, and then question more for the, sorry, techies, is 
wouldn't private private ventures, wouldn't private companies, tech technology companies, don't they model? They do, right? They want to preempt, they want to minimize risk, they want to preempt what can go wrong and what might go wrong. So if they're preempting and, and they're modeling, okay, how if we if we develop a certain technical gadget, this is which market are we going to get? What are the risks? What's the competition? So on and so forth. But then when they link up with citizen collective groups or with the state, they don't model anymore. I would say that was an assumption I had as well. They don't model because there's free money. Mm. One of the things that I'm really tired of hearing about in this sector is fail forward. I say don't fail at all. You should be able to do decent work so as not to fail at all when your work's being funded by somebody else. Mm. So I think this is this is one of the really big culture clash things. I mean, somebody in a seminar recently, I won't say where or who, said to me, innovation is meant to fail. And I said, aid is not meant to fail. So aid-funded innovation is not meant to fail. Square that one. But don't tell us that we should be funding things that know that they're going to fail. When you're being given a grant to develop an innovation, develop it properly. And that's not to say that you can totally avoid failure, but it certainly means don't aim to fail. <laughs> Well, Sometimes the real problem is how the money is being given. So how the competitions and the whole thing is framed, it is making that people who could be doing a good work are not able yeah. to do it. So mm -hmm. no, I very much agree and I think there's shared responsibility there between those who provide the money, those who implement the money, so regranters like ourselves as a program. Mm -hmm. um, and the practitioners who take the money and use it. I really agree. I think you know, there have been some very interesting debates in making all voices count, and we've changed position over time from a very open call type approach where you chuck out small grants and let a thousand flowers bloom and let lots of them die by the wayside, which is very difficult to reconcile with a narrative in the aid sector where you're supposed to be doing effective aid and making sure that there's value for money in every, every penny of aid spent, and a much more careful, brokered approach to selecting and you know, working with people to design initiatives that are likely to succeed. Yes. But to me, yeah, it's, it's a pity that you know, some of those lessons, I think, still aren't fully learned. Just, just a remark, but I guess it's I'm just trying to think about the, the, pow the power dynamics here between the different actors and the fact that maybe the, the, the tech people have more power because they're the people who are creating these solutions and who are implementing them. And you know, the, the people on the research and learning side, which I guess you are part of, are are only there to kind of, I don't know, maybe observe and feedback and um, reflect on what they've done. Um, whereas here you're arguing that what really needs to happen is we need to you know, demythologize um, the benefits of technology and kind of you know, give them a reality check. And that's not that's not really a, a message that they want to hear. So it's, it's mm. kind of this, this yeah, yeah, unbalanced. That, um, yeah, I think there's, 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 there are weird power dynamics that are going on in a lot of these different relationships. But I think there's a particular one around the the power of the expert knowledge. Yeah. So you've got these technologists who are promising the earth in terms of we can apply this in this way, and and you see some very kind of seasoned you know, governance people being seduced by it. And so, you know, going bl following blindly into this technology trap. And then it fails. And then there's this dawning of, oh yeah, we should have asked these very, very basic questions before we just followed this um, technology hype. But at the same time, you've got a lot of those kind of seasoned governance organizations only being funded if they've been providing some kind of technology whizzy uh, project. So you've got these kind of the power of the donors influencing what people are kind of moving towards, but you've also got a kind of expert knowledge problem. Yeah, and I think just on that one, it is useful as well to differentiate between the donors, because on the one hand, there are the sort of the donors that are using public money, which have one type of accountability culture to respond to, and accountability standards and norms. And on the other hand, um, we have philanthropic donors altogether who are freer. But within that, we have some philanthropic donors who are about promoting technologies as necessary for living, because that's where their money is coming from. 
which speaks to Emily's point about which speaks to your point about what is the conspiracy behind this if you want to read it as a conspiracy approach so there are some highly positioned donors who are essentially seeing technology as normatively and unquestionably a good thing and therefore don't want to be sort of held to ransom and ask questions about is this necessarily going to work or is it necessarily a good thing or is this necessarily a direction that lower income poorly connected societies in the global south should necessarily be you know, running in this direction so I think that's a further layer of complexity there, unpacking who the funders are and what their different incentive systems and, and working cultures are. So I was just thinking about one thing, whether I'm wondering whether MOEC had gone into this yet, like the role of proprietary tech, like the already existing the, the Facebooks and Twitter. And this is entirely this is based on my observations about things like um, what happened in, in elections in like informal election monitoring that happens via Twitter hashtags mm -hmm. in Uganda. Least that happened again recently, or social media to bypass people using social media, like using WhatsApp and Facebook to bypass censorship and warranty, and how much, and having come from a kind of uh, background of people looking at like being really paranoid about using those kind of popular platforms because they can be they can make you very vulnerable. Like we've just seen a guy who's been locked up in Thailand for using mm. through Facebook Messenger with a message that was kind of captured through there, but there's often a lot of snobbery about like, oh people just using Twitter, or people just using Facebook or WhatsApp, but there's, I, I wonder how much, how would it be interesting to be looking at actually the technology that's already there and what people, I don't know if there's projects already looking at that, and what your thoughts are about, and sometimes it's not all about what we traditionally think of as accountability, but it might be at kind of flashpoints like elections, those technologies become really interesting. We've, we've had little, haven't we? Calling, yeah. for, calling for innovation projects, we've seen little that was about looking at how proprietary yeah. technologies were working already. Yeah. And that's partly that's because of the selling of it as innovation yeah. being a brand new shiny thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then we there's so much that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. But we have had, had tensions between you and I when I've been interested in looking at more um, kind of everyday technology. Yeah. Say what WhatsApp yeah. usage within a social media. Mm -hmm. It's not a you know, it's not a funded tech platform. Yeah. But it's quite a useful thing that's being used. Yeah, because we've been effect. talking about that a lot. Yeah. 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 I think, in a way, these are some of the kind of nuances and the rich themes that we can now start looking into. And this is one of those, I think, the brilliant opportunities within your cluster that there's enough water under the bridge and time gone past since the kind of birth of this whole field. Um, there's things like that that you can start yeah. kind of looking at them with specific questions in mind. And I think this is part of, you know, yeah, probably by the end of it, making our voices count, we'll have got to answering the sort of set of questions within our research agenda, mm -hmm. which will be a sort of first generation of questions, and then there'll be a whole next generation that I think really will need to probably just take one or two more comments, then. You came back with anything. Yeah, I had a 10 minute call with Melissa to introduce mm -hmm. her, and then so thank you. Sorry for, and then apologies if you cut that. I guess a reflection on failure, and then a question about. Um, how this fits into universal framings of development. So on failure, I think you're right. I think there is some uh, framings of failure which, which are being used to set their expectations and, and then meet them quite mm -hmm. <laughs> um, But then actually why people are talking about failure, I think it's, it's, it's a little bit misguided, but it is in order to enable novel approaches. The idea being that actually we have a number of known, acceptable, reliable failures that govern the way that aid and development works at the moment. And part of the failure debate, and, and they're, they're kind of the things that we all know about, the, the standard accepted procedures and practices that won't get displaced even though there's a huge amount of evidence that they don't work. And the movement towards innovation is about actually saying, well, that's fine, we need to move towards more novel approaches and more um, more radical approaches and failures being framed as a way of actually motivating that. And I think both of those are actually flawed. I think actually failure is a symptom of systematic experimentation in any setting. And we were talking about this last week, actually scientists or innovators in developed country settings don't get a grant and get told to go off and fail. They get told, be rigorous, be systematic, experiment. If you experiment well, we would expect to see some failures, but we would also expect to see some successes. Mm. And I think it's um, 
it seems to think Doug can talk about MABC supporting experimentation, and, and I, I wondered uh, one, one of the questions was really about well, how do you how do you kind of define what experimentation is in that context, and how do you then make sure you've got the senses to know that mm. is what, what you're what they're doing is what you're hoping. Mm. Um, I guess the second question is just about universal framings of development. I've been involved in the last nine months in two forms of activism in this country which have hit the front pages, um, one actually yesterday around um, the kids' schooling thing, where we'd let the biggest event in Brighton around um, the kids' strike. And then in September, around uh, organising a 100,000 person march uh, in support of refugees. Both of those were done on Facebook. We didn't, had we tried to, in the moment, try to develop a new technology to <laughs> enable those yeah very um, time-bound opportunities we would have been absolutely nowhere. So, so why is it we, we need new shiny gadgets for innovation there but not here? And what, what do, What's the universal framing of development say to some of this stuff? Mm. That's really, I mean, on the last one, I mean, maybe just not, not answering directly the point about universal framing of development, but um, the tech innovations that have been pitched at MABC, very few of them have been about using technologies to stimulate collective action. They've been about individualizing. And this is one of my issues. One thing that we social scientists researchers know is that one of the few resources, the few assets that the poor have at their disposal is collective action because they've got big numbers. The poor or the marginalized or the discriminated against. And so I have a kind of you know, deep ideological issue with any tendency to ignore that set of lessons there and, ought, and sort of unthinkingly embrace a whole set of approaches which individualize. Um, the discussion at Tick Tech, at the Tick Tech conference last week with the Tinder Foundation CEO, um, I kind of raised that question because a lot of the issues that, or a lot of the approaches that she talked about the foundation supporting were about getting individual constituents in touch with their MPs. Um, and the fact they weren't being very responsive. And I was like, I'm not surprised that they're not being very responsive. An MP with tens, tens of thousands of constituents probably really wouldn't thank you for getting individually <laughs> said to people. And to me, that's not what the power of organizing is about. It's not, it shouldn't be about generating myriad individual um, complaints or bits of feedback. There's, a, there's a, a magic that has to go on to not just aggregate the individual, but to do something qualitatively different, which is the collective. And I think that and that where feedback loop, in the closing the feedback loop. Yeah. used really lovely the public sees what the public says, which I think is mm -hmm. really yeah. 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 But you know, one of the interesting findings in the Peshot and Fox thing is that that's not absolutely totally uh, a determinant of collective action happening. They say it's important that that happens, but that has to happen and collective action has to happen about it. That happening on its own doesn't necessarily make the collective action happen. That's a whole other set of enabling factors around it. So I think what's interesting is if we're seeing you know, examples like those two that you mentioned in the UK, where technologies were essentially used for their effectiveness and efficiency and speed and mass reach. Availability. So that's not the magic. The magic that's about getting some accountability isn't there. That makes it more efficient. It's like when we were in the Philippines in, in February, we met with the team in the Department of Budget Management that's running the Open Government Partnership sort of program within the, the Philippines. And one of the main things that they've done within their Open Government Partnership action plan has been to digitize all the accounts, the country's accounts, to this country which is 7,700 islands and where accounts have been kept on, you know, scraps of paper or in people's heads or not at all. So they were saying, this is a really important accountability outcome. And I was thinking, is it an accountability outcome? And I questioned um, on it and the response was, and I think it was an absolutely valid, correct response. They said, in a generation's time, no matter what political cycles might happen between now and then, no government is going to undo this. They'd be mad to undo it. This is an efficiency game that nobody is going to knock backwards. So it can only get better from here on in. In a generation's time, there's a generation of citizens who know that all accounts are available publicly in digitized form. So when you think about it you know, as the long game, we can really see that argument. But the, I think you know, that's a really crucial distinction to me between using existing technologies to enhance efficiency and effectiveness and speed for getting collective action to happen versus uh, approaches to innovation and tech which essentially deliberately or accidentally promote the individualization of people's engagement with their government mm. and i think that's something that hasn't really been focused on clearly enough that has big political implications and implications about likely impact and who it will benefit 
we should probably wrap up if you don't want to do one just one, one last response on that and that it just relates to that playing the long game thing. that um, you know I think aid can be very arrogant <laughs> <laughs>